Cool. I'll, I'll start with prayer. So, Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day again. I thank you um, for this class. Just pray, pray that you just be with us. Help us to glorify you what we do and just understand a little bit more about math together in, in your creation, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. You had a question? What is n? n is the uh, the Frenet normal, so it's defined to be, um, you know, t prime divided by the magnitude of big T prime, like by definition. Well, I've never really written formulas in terms of the double derivative because it's not, like the second derivative isn't actually what ends up being it. Um, so we have like gamma, um, gamma of t, let's say, is the, you know, that's the, the, the path we're looking at or parameterization, um, path position at time t, you know? I can't spell. Then if you differentiate that, you get the velocity, right? And the velocity, of course, we can write as the speed times the unit tangent. See, the unit tangent is by definition um, one over the magnitude of the derivative times the derivative. And then the acceleration, right, is, well, it's dv dt, but um, you know, that is d d t of v t. So you see there's two pieces, right? There's the, this is the calculation I did last time. I'm sorry, I'm recycling here. Um, so like the acceleration is not, I mean, the, the normal is not just the acceleration. It's, you know, but that wasn't, I mean, I don't know if that was your question or not, but like, the acceleration isn't directly one thing or the other in the TNB frame. It has two pieces. I mean, like the acceleration um, has a tangential piece and a normal piece, and we, we derived that yesterday. Like the coefficient of the tangential piece has to do with the rate of change of the speed. The coefficient of the, um, the normal piece, is, it's v squared times the curvature, right? Because this is kappa, um, kappa vn. So that gives us the formula, you know. Again, I'm, I think I, I wrote this. La I think I wrote this yesterday. You know, so, but I guess it's the answer to your question. Maybe. Um. So your question is how to calculate n. I mean, n by definition is one over the magnitude of dt dt times dt dt. So like that's how to calculate n. That's how we define the unit normal, the Frenet normal. Although it is true, if you think about it, because we have this equation in problem 30, that if you were given the acceleration and also if you were given, um, you know, the tangent vector, the unit tangent, and if you knew the curvature, and if you knew the speed, you could, of course, put all those things together and calculate the normal from that data. But that would be a weird problem, right? I'm a weird professor, though, so anyway. Other, other questions? Would you guys like to see a few more examples of, like, parameterizations? Let's, let's take some, let's take a stab at some of those. Um, if I can find my juice. So what should we start with? Parameterizing a curve or parameterizing a surface? What do you guys want to do first? Surface. Surface, all right. Very good. So to parameterize a surface is to provide a formula for x, a formula for y, and a formula for z, right? So like a surface 
parameterization is something like R of UV. Um, and we could use UV, you could use whatever, I mean, um, but you're looking for a, an X function, a Y function, and a Z function, all right, that satisfy the criteria of the surface, whatever that criteria might be, right? So, example one, what if you're, you know, just looking to parameterize a plane, right? And suppose that tangent to the plane is the vector 1, 2, 3, and you also happen to know that the vector 0, 1, 0 are in this plane, right? And let's suppose we also know that there's a point in the plane, and you guys can make that point whatever you want. You guys, it's, it's, this is your chance. Whatever point you want. Give me a point. Zero, zero, square root of V. Zero, zero, square root of V. Okay. So thank you, I guess. <laughs> um, so to parameterize this plane, I just use a geometric principle, which is that if you have a plane, right, and if you have two tangent vectors in the plane, and if you have a point on the plane, right, because the plane goes on and on, and because the sum of tangent vectors is again a tangent vector, this is just true geometrically, right? It stands to reason that if we just take the point we're given, plus u times the first vector, plus v times the second vector, that will parameterize the plane. So I can just write it down. Now this right here is an example of parameterization by, well, geometric intuition really, okay? Like I didn't have a, you know, a more concrete um, definition of the plane, and but, but there it is. Now if you wanted to, you could also find the Cartesian equation of this plane, right? How would you do that? Math? All right, so I won't do it, but to find the Cartesian equation of the plane, you would take the cross product of 1, 2, 3, and 0, 1, 0. Oh, fine, I'll do it. So the Cartesian equation and this wouldn't be the parameterization, but the Cartesian equation, if you, you know, if we take 1, 2, 3, and take the Cartesian, pro uh, the cross product with 0, 1, 0, how, how's that go? So you've got x hat plus 2y hat plus 3z hat. I'm going to regret doing this later today. Um, cross product with y hat. So that's just x hat cross y hat plus 3 times z hat cross y hat, also known as z hat minus 3 x hat. In other words, the normal to the plane that I'm up against here is minus 3, 0, 1. So once I, once I know a normal to the plane, I can write down its equation, right? So the equation to the plane here would be what? Minus 3. Now, I only have one point to work with, right? This point right here, so my base point I'll use for that. So I have minus 3z um, plus 0 times y, right? Plus 1 times, my bad, 3z. What's wrong with me? Good grief. 3x, right? Um, and then z, 1 times, oh, oh z minus your, square root of e, yeah, equals to zero. There's, this is the Cartesian equation of this plane, right? So now we could ask a question. We could, we could double check our work, right? How would you double check your work? You, you could see if the x, the y, and the z parameters, you know, parametric formulas here, if they actually work when you plug them in down here. That would be a check on the math we're doing. Right? So if you, if you have an equation which defines your surface, you can take your parametric formulas and you can check if they work or not with the, with the equation. Okay? So here, another way to check it would be, is z actually equal to the square root of e plus 3x, right? That's, that's the defining equation here. So if you look at this, 
if I add these together, what do I have? I've got u, um, 2u, plus v, and then the square root of e, plus 3u. That's it, right? So do those work? This is x, this is my y, this is my z, allegedly, all right? So if we try that out, we got square root of e plus 3 times u. Is that equal to, yeah, and that is indeed equal to my formula for z, right? The interesting thing about this one is y is completely free. So anyway. All right, let's look at another example. I don't think the one in your homework is like this, but, you know, this is an example. Let me, um, <clears throat> what if, um, suppose you want to parameterize um, the surface given by uh, x squared, um, minus uh, 3 y squared equals to 1. We want to parameterize that surface. This is a kind of boring surface. What's it look like? A what? Hi hyperbola? Yeah, I mean, let's see here. So if we just look at the xy plane for a second here, what's it look like? What's that do? Let's see here, we've got, um, if I put x equal to zero, I've got no solution. But if I put y equal to zero, I get x plus or minus one. So this is one of these deals, right? It's a sideways opening hyperbola. So if I was so foolish as to try to graph this, in three dimensions, and I'm, I'm going to regret trying to even do this, but, you know. It's that same curve just stacked on top of itself over and over and over, right? It's like there's one down here and there's one back here, right? And it just goes up. Man. So it's like that. If you can, if you can kind of see it. I don't know if you can see it or not, but nah, I tried. <laughs> Mona Lisa fails and cares. Thank you. Don't make me cough. So how would you parameterize this surface? So here's the thing. If you have a surface where one of the variables, one of the three variables is not really, it's the same everywhere, then usually that's a good parameter. So like here, I would maybe let my u, quote unquote, equal to z. I would let my u equals to z. I think of the u parameters being z, and I could think of the v parameter, well, the, I'm going to say the v parameter, I'll use um, to, let's say, tame the x squared minus 3y squared equals to 1, all right? So what I'll do is a standard trick. I'll let x equal to the cosh of v, and I'll let y equal to the square root of 3, cinch v. If I put these two things together, I know from my study of hyperbolic functions in calculus 2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that that will solve the equation x squared minus 3y squared equals to 1, right? Hooray. And that's all I need to do in order to parameterize this, this surface. What are the parameter, what's the actual formula here? Let me finish the thought. The parameterization of this one is simply r of uv equal to, in this case, cosh v, root 3, cinch v, and then my, my u goes into z. Listen, you don't have to use u and v. And you could actually use the letter for the coordinate if you wanted to. Like I could reasonably just as well 
parameterize the surface by something like r of, oh, I don't know, z theta, or let's say z phi, equal to, well, cosh phi, root 3, cinch phi, and then z. Like this would be an equivalent parameterization. I just changed notation. I actually kind of like that notation more because it more explicitly admits what the meaning of the quote unquote u parameter is here, right? It is the z coordinate. Does this make sense? Example three. How about this? Let's talk about the coordinate planes. The parameterization here of the z y plane, obviously, just use y and z. The parameterization of the x y plane, well, use parameters x and y. The parameterization of the x z plane, well, use x and z for your parameters. How do I uniquely, f and you guys fill in the blanks here. I'll do it in purple. I'll start with the xy, that one's easiest. I put x here, I put y here. What's the equation of the xy plane? The equation of the xy plane is simply z equal to zero, right? So it's a check that this parameterization of the plane satisfies the equation z equals to zero. It's as trivial as noticing that the third component has z equal to zero. Doesn't have to be hard. How about this? I do what? I put y and y is y, I put z is z, and the equation of the zy plane is x equal to zero, right? And then the xz parameterization, I put an x here, I put a z here, I put a zero for y. So sometimes we can use Cartesian coordinates as parameters, right? But not always. Um, example four. Here's one we haven't looked at yet. What if you had z equals to xy? You want to parameterize this. You want to parameterize, what is this by the way? I'll talk about it in the notes. I haven't talked about it too much to you guys because the focus of the course turns to this shortly after test one, but this is a graph, right? We're looking at z as a function of x and y, right? So this is technically a quote unquote graph of a function of x and y, right? So whenever you have a graph, the simple thing to do is to use x and y as parameters. So if you want to parameterize this, all you do, here I'll make it more mysterious, r of st, we'll put x equals to s, we'll put y equals to t, and z will put st. See, now I made it look tricky. But really all we're doing is just, I think it's so much more, I think it's so much more obvious if you just use the Cartesian coordinates as the parameters. Admittedly, there is a danger um, for confusing the concept of Cartesian coordinate versus the concept of parameter. They are different, right? Cartesian coordinate is defined just for the whole XYZ system. It's got nothing to do with the surface we're talking about. But the parameter we could think of, should think of as like a local coordinate to the surface. If I had a blanket which had a grid on it, you could think of the par parametric lines as like a, taking the blanket and like laying it over the surface. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to paste coordinate lines on some surface. That's parametrizing the surface essentially. Um, anyway, notice I don't even have to graph it to parameterize it. It's really just a question of have I satisfied the condition for the whatever it is. Let me, let me show you one more, one, more, one more example and we'll stop with the surface parameterization. I could have something like x squared plus y squared minus z squared equals to, um, equals to 1. I think this is a hyperboloid of, I don't, it doesn't matter. It's either a hyperboloid of one or two sheets, but you know what? It doesn't matter. Let's parameterize it. 
So what I do when I see something like this is I go, okay, if I could make this into like a cosh squared, and if I could make this into a cinch squared, then that'll work because I know cosh squared minus cinch squared is one. So my goal is to come up with formulas, to invent formulas, which makes that identity happen. So I pretty much know I'm going to put z equals to cinch phi, right? Fine. And I want, I want x squared plus y squared to be equal to cosh squared phi, right? Phi is just a letter I made up. You could use Pac-Man there. You could use whatever. You know, pick your favorite letter. I would say that using x, y, or z for phi here is the one thing you can't do. Because x, y, and z here have a different meaning which is reserved and we wouldn't want to contradict it. Yeah? So you guys tell me, how, how, what do I do here then? How can I make that happen? What should I choose? Yeah? Could you use the right Euler functions or exponential functions, Euler numbers? I wouldn't know how to do that. I'm thinking something simpler. How can I get a sum of squares equals to, yeah? Uh, let, me, let me ask it a different way. One, one sec, hold on to that thought, Sam. What if I had x squared plus y squared equals to r squared? Could you parameterize that? What do you say, Sam? I was going to say that x equal to cosine theta y equal to cosine theta. Right, so you're saying let, let x equal to r cosine theta, let y equals to r sine theta, right? But you, are, you already did me the favor of putting R, thinking of R as being cosh phi. We think of the radius of it being cosh phi. So like you just said, cosh phi, cos theta, um, cosh, hyperbolic cosine of phi, sine theta. All right, put it together. We have our parameterization. R of phi theta equal to, well, cosh, phi cos theta, um, cosh phi sine theta, and um, cinch phi. There you go. Now, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is a hyperbolate of one sheet. Can I, let, me, let me show you an entirely more um, complicated way of doing it, which only gets you half of it. Here's another way you can do this. This is the best way. What I just did is the best way. But another way you can do this is to convert this to z squared is equal to 1, um, well, is equal to x squared plus y squared minus 1, right? So that means that z is equal to plus or minus the square root of x squared plus y squared minus 1, which means an alternative parameterization, and I would say a dumb parameterization, is this. You can't have a plus and a minus. You have to pick one or the other. I picked the plus. That, my friends, is a different parameterization just for the upper part of this hyperboloid of one sheet. It's one of these guys. This, this thing, if I was to graph this, it looks something like, like this. All right. And R2, it's only giving you like up here. It's only getting that. Whereas my first choice, my first parameterization gets the whole thing. As is evidenced by the fact that the hyperbolic sign, it goes from all values. As phi ranges from minus infinity to infinity, the hyperbolic sign ranges from, plus infinity, from minus infinity to infinity. That's how hyperbolic sign works. If you don't know the function theory of hyperbolic sine and cosine, you need to learn it because you're using these functions and you want to know what they are. You, you don't want them to just be hieroglyphics, right? You want to know what cosh and cinch look like. It's not complicated. Cosh is this. Cinch is this. That's pretty much it. 
And if you know that, you can kind of, you know, in, anticipate. Well, let me just let me say this is cosh fee. This is cinch fee. I'll just leave it like that. All right, fine. There's some pictures. So, in retrospect, if we go back to my example two, you see here this these parameterizations I wrote down for example two. Does it give you the whole red curtain both sides? <coughs> it does not, right? This necessarily has x equals to cosh phi, which means that is greater than or equal to one by the definition of hyperbolic cosine, by its properties, by its by what it is. So uh, what I'm saying is that that parameterization is not both sheets. It's actually just what? It's actually just the, the part of the, what is this thing called? I guess this is a, uh, is this a hyperbolic cylinder? I think this is a hyperbolic cylinder. A cylinder is simply a shape, which is the graph of a particular curve in a plane, just stacked on top of each other. So we're most familiar with right circular cylinders, right? Which is just a circle stacked on a circle, 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 right? But the definition of cylinder mathematically is just that you have a curve and it's just stacked. It's just, it's just that. So th I think this is a, hyperbol um, a hyperbolic cylinder. And we've just parameterized the part I've drawn better. So hooray. <laughs> right? So does this help? demystify the parameterization stuff a little bit. It is an art, like it's not something that, I struggled with it for a long time because I had this misconception that the parameters had the same like role as like X, Y, and Z, as if I'm gonna somehow find out what T is, or I'm gonna somehow find out what U and V is, right? But that's not how it works. And the other thing is actually finding the formulas for the parameterization, there's no like, that's how you do it. Like I can just tell you, it's educated guessing. If you have an equation, you try to find formulas that you plug into the equation and it works. That's basically it. And sometimes drawing a picture helps, but not necessarily. Like sometimes you can just, this, there's no picture here, right? This, this was window dressing after the fact, right? We did this completely on the basis of just algebraic, you know, strategy. So essentially, if you know cos squared minus sin squared is one, and you know cosine squared plus sine squared is one, that covers a vast multitude of examples. The other thing, of course, is like planes, equations of planes, the normal thing. Like that's in another important bag of tricks. <coughs> yeah? Listen, there are people who their whole career has been founded on finding a particular parameterization of some kind of higher dimensional space. There are spaces which, you know, we only knew in terms of being the common solution set, the common solution set to like several equations. Some researcher said, oh, well, you can parameterize it this way, right? Like, how did they figure that out? Well, it was a spark of genius, right? They had some kind of insight that they just saw. And that was a big part of like what made their career. Like, so it's not, there's no algorithm. It, it, it is a creative process, finding parameterizations. <clears throat> that said, I have given you many examples in the notes. I'd like you to read them and just try to like marinate in what I'm doing. The other thing I've done a lot of in, in terms of finding parameterizations is if the surface you're looking at is something that's sort of native to one of the coordinate systems, right? Like what's native to the XYZ coordinate system? Well, planes which are parallel either the x, y, y, z, or z, x planes. Those are just nice in terms of x, y, z coordinates, right? Cylindrical coordinates, what's, what's nice in terms of cylindrical coordinates? Well, cylinders in the usual circular sense, right? Or half planes. Those are obtained by setting the cylindrical radius equal to a constant or by setting the angle equal to a constant, right? So if you can see your surface as freezing out one of the coordinates in one of our coordinate systems, that makes for a nice parameterization. Like for my final example for today, for this, this regard. So for example six, 
like what's a sphere? Is x squared plus y squared? Let's just talk about the most, you know, most important sphere, the sphere centered at the origin. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to r squared. What is this, what is this in terms of the spherical radius? Well, this is, this is rho squared equals to r squared, right? Which is just rho equals to r. So that is the equation of a sphere and spherical coordinates. It's very kind of, um, you know, unsurprising, I guess. But that actually immediately gives you a roadmap on how to parameterize a sphere. See, because we have spherical coordinate formulas. And you guys have a homework problem where you get to explore this a little bit, right? But y, z, so z is rho cos phi, x is rho sine phi, cos theta, rho um, sine phi, sine theta. These are the spherical coordinate formulas. All right? I derived these from a picture in the notes. We talked about them the other day. My point to you is these tell us how to parameterize the sphere. Because a sphere is simply freezing out one of the spherical coordinates. Right? What are we freezing? See this? Our parameterization, we can use the spherical angles, phi and theta, and we just write down r sine phi cos theta, r sine phi sine theta, and then r cos phi. I think if I had told you guys all this stuff when we first came across this idea, it would have just washed right over you. It may still be doing that. But I hope you've had enough time to like sit and look at those problems that what you're up against is starting to like make sense. This is not a big part of the first test. Like there might be a token problem on this. There even had a lot of homework on it, right? Um, this becomes much more important at the last part of the course where we actually have to parameterize surfaces to do calculations. So this is like life's blood. If you want to do a calculation on a sphere, you need to know how to parameterize a sphere. If you can't parameterize a sphere, sphere you can't like calculate the flux of a vector field through the sphere or something like that. This is the pre-calculus of calculus three, okay? Um, but it's new, right? But isn't that simple? To parameterize a cone, you just take these formulas and put the phi equal to the constant that describes the cone if we're talking about a cone off the z-axis. All right, so um, the other thing I should talk about then is how to parameterize curves. How do you do that? You're like, well, shouldn't you have started with curves and then got the surfaces? Maybe that's true. Maybe I should have started with curves, right? <clears throat> the thing I'm erasing right now, it shows you how to parameterize a hyperbola, right? And I, I, I gave you guys the formulas. Um, so here's one. What if you were trying to parameterize, you got a, you got a sphere. The equation of the sphere is x minus 1 squared plus um, y minus 2 squared plus z squared equals to 4. So this would be a sphere what? What are we talking about? We're talking about a sphere of radius 2 which is centered where? Radius 2 centered at, looks like, 1, 2, 0. So that's just, just saying that's what it is, OK? Does that make sense, by the way? What are we looking at? We're looking at the distance. That formula is what? It's literally the distance from 1, 2, 0 to the point x, y, z, right? So the solution set to that is a set of all points which has fixed distance 2 from the center point 1, 2, 0. Well, that's a sphere, right? Now, so I want to find a curve, right? So let's, let's do something unpleasant. Let's, this may or may not, let's, 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 let's let this thing, let me try to picture it, 1, 2, 0. So that means that the, um, 
the z-axis is maybe like here. So the center of this, my bad, I can't draw this worth anything. The center is at 1, 2, 0 anyway. That's in the xy plane. I guess that puts my coordinate axis like here-ish in my picture maybe. I don't know. I shouldn't try to draw it. All right, so the sphere is, you know, all right, fine. I'm trying to look for, I, I want to find an interesting example of a curve to parameterize, just to show you my method. You're like, I thought you said there was no method. There is educated guessing, that's the method, all right? So we could look at the cylinder, right? I'm not sure exactly what happens here, but if I look at x squared plus y squared equals to 1, then there's some kind of horrible curve of intersection between this cylinder and the sphere, right? Can you see that? Like I'm trying to say, here's a curve, parameterize this curve. The curve of intersection. for the given sphere and x squared plus y squared equals to 1. How should we do this? So when I have a problem like this, and I, I want to assume I'm, I'm th th obviously if, if, if my picture is, is right, right, what happens? It goes out the other side, right? So there's going to be two curves of intersection. I'm interested in the curve of intersection that has z positive for the sake of discussion, all right? So how should I handle this? Here's my thought process. Pick the easiest thing. Pick the easiest thing to control. If it's an intersection of two surfaces, it has to be on both, right? So I can focus totally on this x squared plus y squared equals to 1 and like start with that. See, because I can get this, I just need to do what? Put, put x equals to cosine t, I put y equals to sine t, we got it, right? Well, we've got part of it, right? Because sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So if I do that, I'm on the cylinder. So what does it take then? to intersect the sphere. All I have to do now, it's pretty simple. I plug my formula for x and my formula for y into the defining equation for the sphere. Right? And that gives me what? This gives me, well, cosine t minus 1 squared, right? Plus sine t minus 2 squared plus z squared equals to 4. So if I solve that, I get z is equal to, you know, plus or minus the square root of 4 minus cosine t minus 1 squared plus sine t minus 2 squared. What's the path? What's the parameterization then for the curve of intersection? Do I choose the plus or the minus? Well, I wanted the the one, I wanted the, po the top curve of intersection, right? And so what is it? Yeah, it's the, the, yeah choose the plus, and so our, our parameterization then, R of t, is equal to, well, cos t, sine t, square root, oh man, this is ugly, square root of 4 minus cos t minus 1 squared, Plus. But you know what? Why is it ugly? Well, it's a kind of complicated curve, right? So it's not as nice as the parameterizations we've had for some other things. There you go. That's the parameterization of the curve. So we're simply looking for a formula for x, a formula for y, and a formula for z in terms of the parameter. In this case, I'm using t for the parameter. If you want to, think of it as time. That when I plug it into the defining equations for the curve, it solves those, whatever they might be. 
how we define the curve. It could be as the intersection of two surfaces, right? But there are other curves which we could sort of describe more geometrically. Here, I have a challenge problem for you. I'm not going to work this. You see if you can work it. Suppose you've got the plane. x plus y plus z equals to 1. That's a partly legitimate picture for it. All right? And you take the point. 1, minus 1, 1. That's a point on the plane. Agree? Okay. Parameterize the circle in the plane with that as its center point of radius r. I can draw it. Parameterize. this circle. All right. My hint for you is you should first understand how we parameterize the circle in the xy plane in terms of x hat and y hat. If you understand that carefully, you can also build the parameterization from that circle. If you could find unit vectors in the plane, which are perpendicular, you could build a coordinate system in the plane centered at the 1 minus 1 point, right? You could build, let's say, new coordinates, x bar and y bar in the plane, which are based on a pair of unit vectors which are perpendicular and also tangent to the plane. Can you guys tell me? By the way, what, what are, I'll help you out. Here's a, here's a fun thought experiment. The normal to this plane is what? 1, 1, 1. Can you guys just look at this and tell me two vectors, A and, well, just how about a vector A which is perpendicular to 1, 1, 1? Can you just tell me? Can you guys just like? So Sam just said 1, 0, minus 1. Anybody else have a, another thing you could put which is perpendicular to the 1, 1, 1 vector? Minus 1, 0, 1. <laughs> so minus A? Okay, fine, yeah. <laughs> I like that. That is a very, very lazy modification of Sam's answer. I appreciate I mean, that is, that is very, very lazy, and that's exactly the kind of... Exp exp You're a math major? Okay, very good, yeah. This is why I have to be careful with instructions for higher, like higher level math courses. I have to include things like best answer for best credit. Otherwise, I'll get back, well, put them both equal to zero and it works. It's like, no, I'm interested in an interesting condition, not just the fact that you can put zero in both places. Math majors, so annoying. Anyway, um, how about this? How about uh, like, um, oh, I don't know, one, one, square root of two. Oh, wait a minute, that doesn't work. How about 1, 1, minus 2? Would that do? Listen, there are infinitely many choices. My point is, don't count yourself out. Like, if you can read off, if you're given a vector, you can come up with a, with a perpendicular vector to that one vector by some pretty simple tricks, right? Like, just make one of the things zero, take the two components you're given, flip them, Put a minus on one of them, that'll make it perpendicular. Check this out. If I have the vector ABC and I want to make a perpendicular vector to this, all I do is I go minus B, A, zero, bam, perpendicular. You're like, but the cross product was for making perpendicular things. What does the cross product do? It takes a pair of vectors in, right? and makes a perpendicular vector to both of the inputs. So that's a harder problem. If you're just looking for a vector, which is perpendicular to a given vector, there's all kinds of quick tricks to get it. Now, so you guys can pick whatever you want here, and that gets you started. That gets you one direction, which is parallel to the plane. How do you find another one which is perpendicular to that direction? Well, what you could do 
take the normal, cross it into your perpendicular vector, that'll give you another vector which is perpendicular to both the normal and your tangent vector, which would then also be tangent to the plane. You can use those two vectors normalized to set up a coordinate system on the plane, and with that coordinate system you can build the parameterization for this circle. That would be an example of what I would say is a, is a, is a geometrically motivated parameterization. This is much easier, right? You're just trying to solve two equations at once with a proper choice. All right, enough, 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 enough. So I, I hope that helps. Any, any questions? Yep. Um, on example seven, uh -oh. you what did I do? Is it plus sign oh, good. Gracious, no! Why? And I did it. Ah! <coughs> Quick answer. Follow man. So I'm, I'm behaving. So there we go. Yeah, I. We live in a fallen world. It's true. I've done nothing but math my entire adult life. Modulo this summer where I put up some walls, but. Um, I built a castle another summer, but anyway, mostly I've done math, and I still do that. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so let's let's go on. Now, here you want to know an unpleasant question? Calculate the velocity of this curve. You want to know a more unpleasant question? Calculate the curvature of this curve. Would you like a still more unpleasant question? Is this curve a planar curve? In other words, is the torsion zero? Think about that. To calculate the torsion of this, you'd have to differentiate it, normalize that. It's not constant speed, I don't think. I don't know. The presence of the sine squares and cosines, these squared sines and cosines, it might work out nice. It might, I, I still feel like this might actually be a circle. Nah. It's bent. Okay, so it's, it's like some kind of, maybe it's an ellipse though. I don't know. Yeah. So um, we worked out the, we worked out the, um, you know, whatchamacallit. We worked out the curvature and the torsion and the Frenet frame for a helix yesterday, right? That was relatively easy, wasn't it? It wasn't too bad. Like that calculation is pretty simple. For something like this, though, those calculations become geometrically harder, right? Um, my brother, you know, works at Appalachian. They have this program called Maple there. It's kind of a competitor to Mathematica. He has a, um, a relatively simple curve. And so you can use Maple to, like, symbolically calculate curvature and torsion to a curve, right? We could do Mathematica to do that, too. I just, you guys are lucky I don't have enough time to get up to speed on how to do that. Otherwise, I'd probably shouldn't be making you do it, but you're safe. I don't have time to learn Mathematica at the moment. You're, you're, you're okay. Don't worry. It's not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> um, but anyway, the formula for the curvature or the torsion for a relatively simple curve, he's got one that had like the formula for the torsion was something like 50 pages. Like it's that long. It's not hard to come up with relatively simple curves that the formulas for curvature or torsion are just formidable. Because you end up, dif you're differentiating a square root. And when you differentiate a square root, bad things happen. And when you take the derivative of that derivative, worse things happen. And then you're normalizing vectors, which adds other square roots. So it's just, it's very rooty. Um, so we should talk more about the geometry of curves. Let me do that now. What's that? It's blurry. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's, uh, I probably, I probably skimped too much on like the, uh, you know, whatchamacallit, the size of the, I try to keep the notes small. And so sometimes I try to like go with minimal resolution for my picture. And then, yeah, it actually, it works against me, doesn't it? But on the other hand, I can email my notes to people usually. It's kind of on the bubble of things. I think this is at 15 megabytes now. So, Anyway, let's talk more about the geometry of curves, about what things mean. All right. Um, oh, 
okay, good. So what is curvature? Um, curvature is defined to be, oh, come on, 1 over the speed times the magnitude of the TDT, right? So what I do here is I calculate how that relates to how the, the direction of the unit tangent is changing. So I'm comparing here the unit tangent and then a little bit longer along the curve, the unit tangent at time plus dt. So if I compare the angle between these, we we'll call it phi, the angle between the, the unit tangent at t plus dt and the unit tangent at t, then um, that suggests that dt is the difference between these, right? But then I can also calculate this as, as this, right? So, um, and <clears throat> this gives me that. But then because we're in this um, approximation where we're, you know, um, dt is very small, right? I can approximate this, come on, cosine phi by minus one, um, my one minus one half phi squared, right? That's the uh, power series approximation for cosine phi. So if phi is a small enough angle, and it would be for, for an infinitesimal time, then I get this. So the magnitude of the change in the unit tangent vector is actually equal to the magnitude of the, um, the change of the angle. And anyway, altogether we find that curvature could be understood as plus or minus the rate of change of the, um, the arc length with respect to with respect to the angle. So, um, <coughs> oh, grief. Anyway, sorry, I'm about to cough. And this is, this is really, this is really more interesting, this picture here. So here you have, the, let, me under, let me try to explain what's going on here. The red curve, all right, the red curve is a given arc length. So the length of this red curve is the same as the length of that. Come on, length of that. But here's the difference. This radius is smaller and that radius is larger, right? Radius 1, radius 4. You see what happens? What's the difference? Well, the tangent vector to start with and the tangent vector to end with, it's, it's rotated, right? Like it's, it's rotated a little bit. But this one here, the direction of the tangent vector is diametrically opposed, right? It's, it's flipped in direction. So in other words, in short, the um, the smaller the curvature is, right? Excuse me, the larger the curvature, I'm an idiot. The larger the curvature is, the faster the direction of your unit tangent is, tangent is changing with respect to arc length as you go along the curve. That's how we should understand curvature. It talks about how fast the unit tangent is changing direction as we go along the curve. Any questions? Um, so, I should mention this right here is a picture. What you're looking at actually, this curve, this green curve, what it is, is it's a, it's a curve which has been wound around a donut. So if you take a donut and you just imagine like spiraling around a donut, that's what this curve is in the GIF for my, my website. And what we're looking at here actually is the binormal, the tangent, and the normal. And that little gray thing is the osculating plane. So as time goes on, you can see the Frenet frame traveling with the curve and the osculating plane bending about. Of course, if you actually want to see, um, you know, a, uh, if you actually want to see it, probably should actually go to my website. Here it is. Whee! So as you can see, as the, you know, as we go on, the, I never, I, I'm never consistent in my color coding, right? Here the binormal is blue and the tangent's red. Um, this much is sure, they will be primary, right? You're not going to find any, uh, any pink or purple in my, in my Frenet frame. I wouldn't dishonor it like that. Um, but the, the black circle here is the osculating circle. It's the circle which fits to the curve. It, osculating is a fancy old word for kissing. So, um, so the osculating circle. There you go. So no, no, no osculating in convo, right? All right. So. Normally, would that be changing radius? I guess for the special curve, but I'd really hope for a joke. But anyway, go on. Yeah. Normally, would that circle be changing radius and match the curve, or is that just match this? 
Um, I, that's a good question. Is this always the same? I th think that, well, I, it's so hard to tell from perspective, you know? Is that always the same radius? I feel like the radius might be changing. I, I would think it's changing. Um, all right, let me talk about that for a second. So this curve, again, um, it's from like, Well, that was supposed to be a donut. Anyway, I, I tried. And so, like, there's the, the top. There's, like, the top curve, right? And then there's also, if you want, that kind of, like, there's two natural, those are two curves on it, right? So if, if your curve, if you had a curve on the torus and it wound this way, like, the osculating circle would be smaller. Whereas if you had the curve that was like this, the osculating curve should be big, osculating circle should be bigger. So I'm thinking that if it winds around the torus, it pro probably the osculating circle has different radius, different places. I don't know. That's an interesting question. That's a hard question. Can you find, can you find a, a can you find a curve of constant curvature on a torus? I don't know. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, helix has constant curvature, that's true. So, right, so then people who look at these things more abstractly would say the question like, can you find a helix on the torus? Because they, th well, a helix, they would define a helix more abstractly as a curve of constant torsion and curvature. And you can ask that question in an abstract space, like can you find curves that have constant cor curvature and torsion? All right, we are departing from the course. Let me get back to the course. Um, so, let's see here. So here I actually work out the formula for the oscillating circle. I, I have asked these as homework problems before. I don't think I've done it to you because honestly, like it, it, it's a lot of work with not a big payoff. I, I think you can understand the geometry from the pictures and I'm, I'm kind of content with that. Um, let's see here. I wanted to look at some of these examples. Um, getting there. Let's see here, I'll focus our attention on this particular one right here. So this is an example in the plane. And what I did was I just went ahead and um, looked at kind of an arbitrary curve. So here theta, we don't know what theta is in this example. All right, like theta is some, oh, actually, what am I saying? You could look at theta as a variable, right? You could look at theta as like an unknown function of time, but what did I do? I said it's given by this right here, right? Which means that theta prime prime is what? Theta prime prime is alpha. Theta prime is omega naught. Right? And the third derivative is zero. So the, the theta variable is, is, is quadratic in time. So in physics, this would be what we would call um, constant, a constant angular acceleration for this path. Alpha is the so-called angular acceleration. And uh, anyway, so we can calculate the derivative and we do the chain rule. And the d theta dt is this, right? And then the speed is the square root of the squares of these, which works out to that. Um, and then you can calculate the arc length by integrating the speed. And there it is, which works out to this here, if I'm assuming that um, that's positive, just for the sake of niceness. Um, anyway, so then there's the formula for the arc 